Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. You guys, this is Heather McMahon. I'm obsessed with her. Hi, honey. I'm <laughs> obsessed with you. How are you? No, I'm so great. Uh, you're just a powerhouse and I love watching everything you, you're doing. Uh, actor, oh, freaking yeah. stand-up comedian, powerhouse sensation. <laughs> I am putting and- that on business cards. <laughs> I'm going to put actor, stand-up comedian, powerhouse sensation. And if that doesn't get me a good table at an Olive Garden, I don't know what will. <laughs> That's amazing. That's truly the best intro anyone has ever done for me. Well, I'm just, I love you. Your podcast like helps me so much. Just freaking laugh and giggle through the days when I'm like, I don't like anything. But I love mm-hmm. you and Tara Masubich. Well, Tara Masubich, I can't believe you listen. I'm so honored. Listen, oh my I gosh, so- yes. I sometimes l- go back and listen to my own episodes just for like quality control. Like, make sure the sound <laughs> it sounds good. Da, da, da. And I'll listen to it some days and be like, "This is unhinged." How would, would anybody tune into this shit and take me seriously? <laughs> <laughs> but that's but I'm, what's I'm so, so fun about it. I'm laughing because yeah. I'm like, "What is happening?" Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and I think we all need that. That's so thank all. You. Off, listen, I, I'm just so glad I could get back and, you know, laughing cause you don't know what's happening <laughs> is also what happens when people have sex with me and cause they don't know. <laughs> They're like, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to enjoy this or if I'm trapped. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, how are you? What's going on, girl? You and Callie right now? Shredding the norm? No, what are you doing? I moved, I moved to Nashville. Oh, that's I'm right. I'm South. Yes. I forgot. You are. Yes. You did what we all did. We all got out. Mm -hmm. I had to get back. You're in Atlanta. Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And with I, first of all, how is it living with your mom? (laughs) (laughs) Okay. This is the best thing. I was at a golf tournament in Italy this past weekend and a girlfriend of mine whose husband's a famous player was like, so when are you guys moving out? And I was like, what do you mean? She's like, well, like, this was a temporary thing with your mom, right? Like, you guys are building a house, right? I was like, no. I was like, we're not <laughs> going anywhere. We're redoing my old home. So for people who don't know, during the pandemic, my husband and I moved in with my mom. Um, and basically my child at home, which is, you know, we call it Chateau McMahon. And it is, it is, you know, we thought it'd be like a little a uh, temporary thing, but we are full throttle. We are, we're, we're three's company. If you've seen everybody loves Raymond, that is basically my life. <laughs> Our King of Queens, um, where, uh, you know, Kevin James dad lived with them. That is what I do. I live with my mom. It, how is you it? Think- you, you asked me how it was and I didn't have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> how is it? Um, Hannah, I am holding on by a thread some days and then other days it's wonderful. You Are know? you like, cause you're gone a lot. How did you get yeah. Jeff to agree Sign to up this? For that. Yeah. Can I tell you, Jeff was the one who had the idea. Now, obviously I'm very close with my mom. So, you know, my mom and I are like, I always say that our relationship is like Joan and Melissa Rivers, but we're both Joan, right? Or we're okay, like yes. Chris and Kim Kardashian, but we're both Chris, right? So, um, no, he, my mom treats my husband like King king shit. Okay. He is, she's making him meatballs right now. Like, I'm not even kidding you. She's upstairs. He's playing golf. She's making him a meal. Um, she's also making him a lamb chop because he was worried that the portions were too small. <laughs> like <laughs> he is waited on. She adores him. Um, so life is good for Jeff. You know, I'm the one who gets barked at. I come home. My mom is so funny because, you know, obviously thank God the cr- comedy career has taken off and I pay for a lot of things now. And my mom, I walked in the door for my Italian vacation. I took two weeks off of work. I've worked and been traveling all year. I was like, I'm going to go away for two weeks with my husband. I come home. As soon as I walk in the kitchen, my mom's like, you know, you owe me money. I'm like, for what, mom? (laughs) She's like, you know, I had to pay the dog groomer the other day. I was like, all right, mom, let me know how much it was. 200 bucks. I will go to Chase. I'll get you cash. She's like, you need me to write write me a check right now. I'm out $200. So does not matter how old you are, how successful you are? Your mother will always nickel and dime you as soon as you walk out, walk in from your vacation. That's just Robin. You know what I mean? I am obsessed with Robin. I really enjoy on the podcast. Um, for you guys that are listening, Heather has a podcast called Absolutely Not. It's so funny. But you sometimes have your mom on. Those are my yeah. favorite. Just for you to know. Yeah. Y'all's dynamic is hilarious. Also, I love Ray. Never met yeah. him. Love him. Yeah, he's great. Um, do you, 
do you get your just be like your comedy like from your mom like was she always like funny cracking jokes growing up or was your dad also like that yeah my um my late father was super funny but my mom is also just kind of fearless and I think that that's very I always grew up with that like just say it like it is um have no fear uh she's a very joyful person that's the biggest thing is I've realized like now that I've been in this industry a long time there's some people who just aren't joyful, right? There's a dark side to everything, but I really can find the humor in any situation. And I think my positive disposition and my positive outlook on life, no matter what's happened has always been because my mom has that attitude. You know, she yeah. kind of grew up in the shit and had a rough upbringing, but she doesn't let it hold her back. And she's, she's just a positive ray of light, which I, when she's not screaming at me about the $200 <laughs> I owe her. <laughs> I want to go back. You said like your mom, yeah. she has like, she's so joyful yeah. and how, even in hard situations, it's taught you like how to find that joy. And yeah. I've um, watched your special first of all, so freaking good. But Thank it's interesting because you. you do talk about like probably one of the hardest times I would I would think in anybody's life you you lose your dad and yeah. But it's you obviously make it freaking funny, right? Is that how you deal with grief, would you say, is laughter and finding finding the joy in a really shitty situation? I think it's a survival technique, like especially in that moment when I was obviously grieving the loss of my dad, because what, what people don't really realize, and I mean, I make a brief joke about it in the special, but my dad from the day, the moment he was diagnosed to the moment he died, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. It was only one week. So I don't have the same connection to other people when they talk about, you know, my mom was struggling with cancer. Or my dad did, you know, rounds of radiation and chemo. It was very quick. I mean, he could have had a heart attack at a Waffle House would have been, I think, a more fitting death. Mm -hmm. So for me, it, it happened so quickly. So it's not like we had the moment to like go through the process of grieving like we know it's coming. And, and I know that so many other people who've dealt with cancer before kind of struggle with that. They're like, it, it, listen, that doesn't make it better. Right. Um, but my my whole point is just saying like, I was, you're in such a fight or flight stage after you go through something traumatic like that. And I had two, two, two ways I could have handled it. I mean, I was depressed for a minute. You know what I mean? I was eating mm -hmm. my feelings. I got into like crippling credit card debt. You know, I was like, <laughs> my dad would want me to get these Manolos, you know, and I had <laughs> no money in my bank account, zero zilch. So, you know, thank God things turned out. So that way I can pay that off. But, um, I, I finally had to pull myself up by my bootstraps and I'm like, the only way I can really move through things or have ever been able to process things good or bad in my life is through giggles. That's just mm -hmm. like, I'm the kind of person at a funeral, I'm going to laugh in that awkward moment. If you fall down a flight of stairs, I'm going to be crying laughing. <laughs> you know, I don't know if that <laughs> says something about me um, psychologically, but I've always just have to find in those uncomfortable moments, find what makes me giggle about it because mm -hmm. it's like survival. You know what I mean? Yeah. Absolutely. Were you, were you, you weren't in Georgia when this all happened. Were you still like doing the comedy thing in LA, New York? Where were you? Yeah. So I was living in LA and then all of this happened over Christmas break. So I was actually at my best friend's wedding and my parents were supposed to come down to Puerto Rico for my best friend's wedding and they didn't come. And I had this weird feeling that and I told my husband and my husband thought this was the weirdest thing. I said, my dad's dying of cancer. He's like, you're insane. Your mom said it was no a gallbladder. Like I swear, Hannah, on my hand to God, I ha I knew something God, I, I think he prepared me in a weird way. It was just like an, like this thing that said, you need to be ready for this. So I fly back to Atlanta and my sister picks me up from the airport. And the first thing I say is, dad has cancer. And she's like, I told mom not to tell you. We didn't want you to like be worried. Like you had two days of your friend's wedding. Like you didn't need to come home for it. And I was like, mom didn't tell me. I just had this feeling. So I, um, so then he passed very quickly after that. And then I basically like went back to LA, packed up my bags and moved home because I thought, all right, well, you know, my, my sister was starting her law practice. I knew that she was, couldn't handle all this stuff. And I knew my mom needed the help. So I just kind of picked up my life and moved home thinking it was going to be a very quick three months will grieve. And then I'll get back to like, you know, slinging jokes. And then I was home for like two years and it was this wild thing that like, then my career kind of took off because I wasn't trying to impress people in LA. I was just very authentically going through the grieving process. And then it ended up just being this like hilarious, um, 
kind of almost like a Britney 911 spiral <laughs> on the internet, which when I look back, I'm like, I wasn't in a great p- place in my life, but everyone found it entertaining. But I think it opened me up to being a lot more vulnerable. And I had a deeper, richer point of view and perspective for my comedy that just kind of enriched um, my my point of view a little bit. So it, maybe it made yeah. me a little bit more relatable. I don't know. I only know you as, as I said, the sensation that you are. <laughs> When was, <laughs> when was like it in the tank? What was your come up like? Mm. Um, a comedy come up is pretty, uh, it's pretty gnarly, but you mean like, when did I figure out that this was going to work or <laughs> no, like what was, yeah, I guess like what was the come up like? Because I know that it's hard, but mm-hmm. when you said you were like at home with your mom when you're like, ask God, like, God, like, please help me financially be able to take care of my family. Like what, what was that like that time when it wasn't going like you thought it was going to go? It's interesting. It was actually one of the, you know, while I was going through the grieving process, I will say I was the most creative I had been in a really long time. I started doing a lot of characters and putting on wigs and I would literally shoot stuff in my backyard gorilla style with my mom holding the camera. Now, granted, this was, you know, seven years ago when Instagram, everything could be grainy and didn't need to be like professionally edited. Nowadays, Mm -hmm. I think I, I'm so desperate to go back to like that raw footage, that raw time of creativity. Um, But it was just, I I don't know. I was like, I kind of had nothing to lose. And this Mm -hmm. is what sucks about, you know, you get the success and like, I'm, this is my first big special and I wrote it and I'm produced it myself and I'm all excited about it. But I've just been, been up at night having these like horrible nightmares and night sweats of just like, okay, I built this myself. Now, what if, you know, one person hates it and they can tear it all down. It's, it's, it's a wild feeling, you know, before I didn't really have any worries or cares because I was like, I was doing it out of just sheer joy. And I was like, all right, maybe three people are seeing it. And then as you get more eyes on you, you also then start to see the, the crazies come out. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it, it's a vicious cycle. I'm so grateful though. I have to just be like, listen, this first world problems. I can't believe everything that I said I was going to do. I'm, I'm doing. Um, but there definitely is this like, you know, fear inside where you're like, not everyone's going to love me, you know? <laughs> like, no, I, it's so crazy you're talking about this right now because I was just writing down in my journal because I have felt so, the past few years, honestly, like so stuck creatively and mm-hmm. like what I want to say. Like it's not, it, I uh, like wrote today, I'm like, it's not that I don't think I have anything to say. It just feels like it's stuck in a vault that I don't have the, the, the code keys to. to. Yeah. Because it's there and like I know it. But I think some of the fear of, oh, there's more people. I, I, I didn't care. I used to not care at all, but mm-hmm. now I really do. And it makes it hard. Have you felt like you've still been able to like hold on to that part of you that just is still creative and doesn't care and puts it out there? Because it feels like it, like as somebody who is a listener, I yeah. still feel like you just like give it your all, but I, you know, you never know what's going on. It's interesting of your mind when I'm on tour and I'm doing my stage shows, I do not hold back. I let it rip. I don't think twice because I know that everybody, even if they don't know who I am and they come and they paid money to sit in that seat, they're Mm going to leave being entertained and have a good time. I also feel that way about my podcast. Like I let it rip. That is like my safe space to just like have a good time. I will say the internet has changed so much since I was on the come up. Like the TikTok world is also so interesting. You have to play the game to be a part of it and do it. But it is so funny how when people find you, like some of the messages I will get are unhinged. You're like, you're literally dipping your toes are really when you, when you start to pop off on TikTok, I'm like, I am diving headfirst into full on crazy town. It Mm -hmm. is not people who are searching for your stuff. Like however the algorithm works, you are just being sent out into the universe. So you get people who a don't understand satire, don't understand your comedian. Like I've had somebody one time, like think that I was a neuroscientist and sent me a DM and they're just like, <laughs> you know, this is like false information. I was like, I didn't get ready with me makeup tutorial. Like I don't, I'm not from Harvard. Like what are we doing here? So I do think it's so funny. Like as the audience expands, you do have to now kind of cut through the BS if you will. But I, I have to find these moments of just being like, if it makes me giggle, I know it's going to bring somebody else joy. So I just kind of have to like rest on my own laurels, if you will. Yeah. Is that a yeah. phrase? I Rely think- on my own 
laurels, morals, whatever. You know what I'm trying to say. I know. I, I know what you mean. Uh, yeah. What would you say your comedy style is? Because it's, it's whatever I think is funny, but I don't know mm-hmm. what that is. Mm. Well, you said unhinged earlier, which I think is a <laughs> key word. Um, no, my comedy style is, okay, I guess if you've never heard me before and you had to think of like three famous people that you could tie up in a bow, I would say I am Joan Rivers meets Conan O'Brien meets a touch of Kevin Hart. Okay. Like that is to me, yes. my energy, my stage presence, all those three, my, my giggles, my sarcasm is all those three. Um, but my style is, I'm listen, I'm the butt of my own jokes, right? It's always about me. It's never going to be about somebody else. I may throw in other people's names and how, but it will always revert to, I'm the butt of my joke. So it's a safe space, you know, like mm-hmm. come it's giggle. Um, I just, it's, it's not that deep, you know, <laughs> it's yeah. about what I've been through, my point of view, my perspective, what it's like to be a woman in this business, what it's like to be a woman in the world. I've always you know, touched on things that women go through. A lot of times in comedy, you have to play to the boys and the guys come and they have a great time at the show because it's all relatable. But I was like, my audience is women. So I'm going to talk to women about what women are freaking going through. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, I love it. Like it is, it's so refreshing. And I feel like you're really good at being a storyteller. Does that come from your parents? Like that is what yeah. I notice is I like see it, feel it. I am there. I am, I am giggling the whole yeah. time. It, but is that just like a craft that you've always had? Like, were you one of those kids that was like telling these like crazy made up stories? Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I, listen, I started doing stand up when I was 16 at my high school prom. Cammy was there who owned show me your moo. She has the tape, but no, I've been doing stand up forever. So it was just, I, I love telling stories. I mean, I write for television. Um, I, you know, I've just always been a writer. So for me, I'm like, how can I audibly explain in, you know, the best way, these crazy things that have happened to me in my life. So yeah, I was just always a nutty kid. And like, I was the kind of kid at like my parents' dinner parties after everybody had like six martinis, I'd put on my tap shoes and a top hat and like give them a show (laughs) razzle dazzle, you know, that's just me splits. Yeah. Do the splits a hundred percent. I really appreciate that about your special too. And your, and your comedy shows is like, it is, you're not just going and listening to somebody stand there and talk and like, just kind of stare at the floor and just yeah. say a joke every once. It's a, it's a performance. And I really yeah. appreciate that. You know, I'm an old theater kid. I like to show up to shows in, in my best suit. I've always been like that. I like you to come and feel a lot of different emotions. And that's always been important to me. Listen, there are phenomenal comedians who can stand in a dark room and just give you one liners, but I want you to see my face and the expressions I make and the physicality I'm like in my body. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's just, it's always what's made. It's always what I've connected to. I mean, you have this huge community that supports you. Like, what do you think it is? Like, what was your secret sauce that you think that's created that? I think it's cause I was just really raw and real and don't care about like looking stupid or ugly or whatever. Like I've just been like saying all the things that I feel like a lot of women have felt and thought and, and just haven't had the platform to say, you know, Mm -hmm. um, I've just been kind of letting it rip and I don't really apologize for it. You know, are you really good about like, um, being, cause a lot of people don't always run their Instagram, but I feel like Mm -hmm. it seems like it's really you. Are you really good about like DMing back and forth and it is always me that? Yeah. I hired this great girl, Emily, shout out to Emily. She's like 25 and she helps me like edit videos and we'll do like podcast posts, but it's always me in the DMS. Uh, Mm -hmm. that is my, that is my treasured space. And I feel bad because I can't get through them all the time. I try and open like five or 10 a day and respond to people. But like when people see me out in the street and they're like, Hey girl, we were just chit-chatting last night. I'm like, Oh yeah. You know, whatever. Kelsey. Yeah. We were chit-chatting about shoes that you liked that, you know, you want the link for Like it's always me. Um, But I will say um, it's helped giving outsourcing a little bit of like, I can't sit and edit TikTok videos for two hours. I'll shoot the content, but if somebody else can edit it for me, that is like, let's work smarter, not harder. You know? Yes. No, I totally agree. Like do what you're good at. I have somebody that will help me with, I can't, I don't know how to edit all that stuff. I don't have time for that. Um, Yeah. Actually, Kami's the one that told me 
that I had to do she, that. She is the one who told me too, because we were in the Hamptons after I did a show at Radio City in June, and we were in the Hamptons, and she was like, why are you editing your videos? And I was like, Cammie, I'm a one-woman one, one woman operation. And she was like, this is insane. We can find somebody who has got nimble fingers, who is young, and who <laughs> knows what's going on. And sure enough, she told me, like, work smarter, not harder. Don't be an idiot. Shout out to Cammie yeah. Miller. We love her. We, we, we miss you. We love her so much. Yeah. Um, okay, so obviously comedy is going really great for you. Yeah. Uh, you are on your second tour. Yep. But you also are in acting, too. I mean, like mm-hmm. – you did that too. Is that still something that you're pursuing? Is that like a, what like, do you call that even, it's not even like a side hustle. It's still like a huge other career, but yeah, what's your well, focus on these days? So, some days it feels like a side hustle. Let me tell you what. I have auditioned for every TV show, every movie, anything that's come out in the last five years, I have submitted a tape for. And it is my favorite job in the world to just sit back on the couch and watch all the other famous actresses who have booked those roles (laughs) instead of me. And each time I'm like, "Mm, they probably deserve that. Um, No, I mean, I I was, uh, you know, I went to school for acting. That is my first love is theater and and, uh, being on camera. But with stand-up, I was always able to make my own opportunities. And I was like, if Mm -hmm. I write it and you build it, they will come. And so no one can tell me no, which has been really refreshing. I mean, I have a TV show that we're developing at NBC, you know, but all of that stuff takes so much time. And there's so yeah. many other people who have to give you permission with stand up and with comedy and, you know, writing jokes. If it's, it's a thought in my head and I put it out there, it's out there and I don't mm-hmm. have to wait for permission. So, I mean, yeah, I would love to be on like the next hit succession spinoff where I get to play someone. Here's the thing here. I say, I'm so sick of myself. Like in stand up, I talk about myself podcast I talk you know you draw from real life experience I want to put on a wig I want to play a cafeteria lady who's addicted to meth <laughs> who has a heart of gold but you know maybe she gets a couple DUIs like let me be that character I'm ready <laughs> put me in coach but you do have this Netflix special that I never yeah. had and I'm interested how that even like works do you put do you pitch yourself for that or did they come to you so it can work a lot of ways. Whitney Cummings, who's one of, who's been kind of a role model to me in the comedy world, was like, produce it yourself. Don't wait for anybody to give you permission. So I went ahead at, at the tail end of last year when I knew my tour was wrapping up, and I went ahead and shot it. And my um, creative partner, Jen Zabrowski, directed it. She and I are the ones who are developing the show at NBC. And I then I said, let me send somebody a finished product because these – Folks, you know, at all these big streamers or at at networks, they may not know who I am per se. So then I tied it up in a pretty bow and I sent it off and then we had people bidding on it and who wanted it. And um, now it's going to live at Netflix, which is the coolest thing. And so even though this is coming out, I'm also producing my own next special that I'm shooting in three weeks in Atlanta. And then I'm just going to keep doing that and then, you know, uh, let people take it where they want or, you know, that way also creatively, like I can control what I what I get to do. Mm -hmm. You know, again, do you I don't – go ahead. Sorry. No, do you think that's the the key? Because I feel like this is something I need to be better about. It's like I think sometimes I wait and think, oh, I'm not good enough. I'm, I don't know how to do this. I've never done this before. But yeah. do you feel like that is actually the key to success is just going in and, like, doing it for yourself? Do it. The best advice I got was don't – again, don't ask for forgiveness. Don't ask for permission. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think a lot of times we – Listen, I was in like a freeze frame like you were talking about earlier about like, well, I'm not being creative enough. And I'm like, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. I'm going out on the road. I'm doing 90 minutes a night. I'm having to come up with a new hour every week on the podcast, doing all this stuff. Like just because you are working behind the scenes and people don't see it right in front of their faces does not mean that you're not putting in the work. Like I was working Mm -hmm. my ass up on the road and I was like, but nobody is seeing this. You know, obviously people are coming out to my shows and it's incredible. But I was like, but how do I open myself up to the next you know, a group of folks that don't maybe know my name. And so I was like, I'm just going to do this myself. And then it's just been awesome to see how, you know, it helps me sleep well at night to be like, all right, people universally love to giggle. So here we Mm -hmm. are, but it's still scary. I mean, I'm putting my own time, money, effort, you know, and, and it's also feels as this sounds so cheesy and trite. And I apologize to anybody who's listening, but with this first special, I'm like, again, I shot this a year ago and now it's coming out to the world. And it's like my creative process. It feels almost very vulnerable. I'm like, Mm -hmm. it's out there. It's out there for anybody to make a comment on. But that was even my real story about how I 
lost my dad and how I went through life and what I was like as a kid, my childhood and all these stories woven together and how I suffered with infertility and still do. And I talk about egg freezing and all these things. And I'm like, it's, it's out there for anybody to mm-hmm. say anything and judge. And that's kind of a weird feeling. But then I also have to be mm-hmm. like, yeah, good. Oh, <laughs> 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 well, well, you know, uh, it's so good. I'm so excited for people to listen to it. How do you come up with this material, like you are, like you're on the road all the time. You have yeah. to carve out an hour, like find an hour of material. Do you ever feel like I'm just, I don't have anything funny to say or no, that's not a problem you have because you are uh-uh. just funny. No, there, <laughs> listen, there are days where I, sometimes I walk into the podcast and it's just me. I don't always have guests. So there are mm-hmm. times where I'm like, okay, all right. We're just staring at the wall. And then it turns into some like deep psychotic therapy session. You can always tell the the solo episodes are always the most unhinged because I'm just kind of like talking. It's like stream of consciousness. And then the next thing you know, it's like I have uncovered some deep, dark secret from my past. That, you know, <laughs> and I'm just sharing with the Internet. I'm like, this is awful. Um you know, listen, I won't complain because this is my job, but there is definitely, I mean, you get it. Like you were saying, you feel like creatively stifled the other day with, you know, you used to just be able to do Instagram and you used to just do Twitter or whatever. And now you got to have your hand in so many different pots, if you will, that there are days that you can feel a little singed, a little burned out. But, um, I don't know. I usually just, you know, watch a dark episode of the first 48 and then something makes me giggle. And I'm like, all right, <laughs> like that. We'll She's talk back. about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. So you're always working on like stand up material and then you have this yep. podcast. How do you decide? Like, are there times where you're like, I don't want to talk about that. I got to keep that. I got to put it in my pocket because that mm-hmm. is, that's for show. That's for the stand up. How do well, you, what, 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 how do you do that? Um, well, that's why I knew people wanted to hear a lot about my wedding and I knew that there was so much unhinged shit that happened at the wedding that I knew that that was material, you know, I mean, Mm -hmm. to do a 90 minute show, you got to have some jokes. So I wanted to keep that sacred. And like what happened on the honeymoon, I shared a lot on Instagram, but I didn't tell people like the real deal. So I keep that. I mean, I know, and I, I'll wake up in the middle of the night and I'll like, um, grab my phone and just like record a joke or a thought or something. So there's a lot of things that I hold, but you know, and people have told me, other comedians have been like, why don't you use this material for your podcast? I'm like, no, I already did that. And they're like, you're crazy. Mm-hmm. You're doing too much. But um, my my shows are very, um, they're very special to me. So I really try and give people my all. And that is also mm-hmm. why I sweat like, you know, uh, Paris Hilton taking the SATs. I mean, I come off stage <laughs> and my, my suits are drenched. It's disgusting. Also, that joke isn't really relevant anymore because Paris Hilton is a boss bitch. It's actually it's, really smart, but she's so smart. I read her, I read her book and it was phenomenal. I will say it's like me taking the SATs. Cause that's people are like, why'd you get into comedy? I say, well, I saw my SAT scores and I knew that there wasn't much going on scholastically, <laughs> you know, that's it. I don't agree. I feel like you have to be so smart to do comedy. You have to be good on your toes. And like, I'd make a great politician, but don't ask me to like do your taxes or you're definitely going to jail. <laughs> you know, I'm like, you will get audited. If I'm in charge of your finances, forget it. Hannah, what's your sign? I'm a Libra. A Libra. Okay. I don't hold a lot of weight in a lot of these signs, but there is one thing that there's two things that they say about Pisces, which is what I am. It's like super creative, terrible with money. And I'm like, yep, that, <laughs> that's me. Is there anything so that I'm, they say about Libras that you? Yes. And it's true. I'm so, I, I want balance. I can see every side. That's why I would make a horrible politician. Well, actually I'd probably be a good politician. Cause I would, I would see everybody's side, mm-hmm. hear everybody out and be like, okay, I understand that. I see your side, but that makes me where I cannot make a decision to save mm. my life. Yeah. That sucks. I wish I had that. Like, I know exactly what I want to do and this is how I'm going to do it, but that Discernment. is not, no, don't have it. Okay. I, we're going to pray on it. Yeah. Hannah, we're going to pray on it. You're going to be praying specifically for discernment. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I actually, Mm -hmm. I got you. I didn't. Yeah. Discernment. That's what I need. You will always be crippled. You will always feel like, listen, I've realized this now more than ever. Like now that I get crazy DMS and messages, I'm like, there are going to be people that don't like me Mm -hmm. point blank period. I can't tell you some of the shit I've read about myself online. That is like not true. Uh, That is just unhinged insane. But I'm like, I just have to 
the people that do enjoy me will come back. You know, Mm -hmm. like I just have to not worry about it. Don't worry about it. You're not always going to be everyone's cup of tea, but if you don't do things creatively to fulfill yourself, then that's, then that's a problem. Yeah. No. Cause like, uh, Libra is like, we love beauty. We love finding, Mm -hmm. um, like creating, but that that's where it's like this hard thing because then we can be so indecisive of actually like going and creating and doing. Yeah. So I'm always really, I love when people just like, don't give a shit and can go do their thing like that just inspires me so much. And I always seem to keep people like friends around that are like that because if I'm around them, then it kind of gives me that permission Mm -hmm. to also just be like it. Yeah. But by myself, I can just like get in this deep, scary hole of, I can do nothing. Just stare at the wall. Yeah. Stare at the wall a lot. Really Listen, weird. I think we can all get in that. You know, I heard something recently that really honestly inspired me. And it's like, if it doesn't scare you, then then why are you like, then what are you doing? I want to go tell jokes. Again, how do I bring joy? That's my gift. I got to go win them over and I got to go entertain mm-hmm. them. So I said, this is really scary, but I'm going to go do it. No, I, I, I agree. I, and that's actually when I do, when I do the scariest stuff is always when I'm my best. Yeah. But it's it's forcing myself to do it. I think yeah. it's, it's the hardest step. But once I do it, I'm like, ah, oh, free fall. Let's just not die. Um, and then you never regret. You never regret the things you did do. You only regret the things you didn't do. Right. True. True. Yeah. So just do it. Nike. Yeah. Oh, just do wait, it. What is this? Is this become like an? <laughs> you're inspiring me. Coaching no. me up. I love it. I, l- I love a little pep talk. You know what I mean? I'm also just you shitting do. my pants in life. I am absolutely faking it till I make it. So take any advice or no advice. Okay. I want to talk about the wedding because you said that's yeah. like the material of your show that you, of the tour that you're doing right now. Right. And that you are going to be filming mm-hmm. in Atlanta. In November. Yep. And the- yes. Um, I mean, I'm re- going to get married here soon. And I've been yeah. talking about doing like a Southern wedding Mm because you're also from the South versus a destination. And I'm really trying to get Adam on the train of destination. And I kept telling him, I've been showing him yours in Italy. And I'm like, look how much fun everyone's having. Everybody Mm -hmm. came. said it was like with the best uh, wedding she's ever been to. What made you decide to just go all out on your wedding? Or it seems like you went all out. Maybe you didn't, but it seems like it was pretty yeah, it, it was. I'm, I do say in, in, um, on tour right now that I do not make the fi- financial commitments that I did. I definitely could have pulled back on the fireworks, if you will. <laughs> um, but again, I'm a new money bitch, so I don't know how to say no to things. <laughs> um, here's my thing. One, do whatever is special to y'all. Okay. I basically, because I'm, you know, I'm in my late thirties. Like I was getting, I was kind of the tail end of a lot of my friends who are getting married. And so mm-hmm. Jeff and I are happy place is Italy. That's where we go. I mean, we, I just got back last night from Italy. Like that's just where I thrive. And so I said, listen, this is where I want to get married. I'm going to do this. And if people want to come great, if they don't, I will not be offended. I know it's a large financial commitment and time commitment for people. Well, I just so happened to have gotten married right after COVID. So everybody was literally like itching, scratching (laughs) at their walls to get out of the house. So my wedding planner was like, oh, you know, you probably only get like 60%. We had like 120% of people show up to this wedding because they're like an excuse to go to Europe after we've been locked in our houses for three years. Like, we'll see you. Um, And it ended up being the best because the people also, here's the thing. Don't worry about this guest list. Invite the people you actually want. Don't be pressured to invite your fourth cousin, Lisa, who always causes a scene and makes it about her and is a pain in the ass. You do you. The best advice I got was just invite the people you want there. And the Mm -hmm. folks that show up for you, who can show up for you will, and just let it go. Like, you know, I I did not feel forced to invite people I I wasn't crazy about. I just was like, if my rule of thumb was if when my dad died, if I heard from you and we're still close, like then you got an invite. (laughs) You know, (laughs) literally I was like, did you text me when my dad died? All right, you can come to the wedding, you know. Weddings are so expensive and like how but here's do I the thing. If you go the wedding, if you go abroad, it's cheaper. Okay. I, my, no way. Oh yeah, girl. Oh, I, oh, honey, if you want to get married in Italy, I will hook it up. It is always cheaper. I mean, also do cut the fat, 
cut the fat. That's what I said. When I went to Italy, I was like, I'm cutting the fat. I was in a big sorority at Ole Miss. You were in a big sorority at Alabama. Yes. You get it. Like if we, and no, no, no. And, and people, especially too, when you get a little TV screen time, they start coming out of the woodwork. Like, oh, hey girl, haven't talked to you in 15 years. Where's that invite? And you're like, I'm not having bridesmaids. Like get the back of the line. Yes. Like, what are we doing here? Yeah. No, I found that doing international, of course, I say in my show that I ended up somehow making a cheaper wedding, the most expensive thing I could have ever done because I'm a sociopath, but, um, <laughs> you can do it abroad much cheaper. What, what is the premise or like, what are you talking about? What in this so, new tour? The new tour is all about my first year marriage. What I learned planning okay. the wedding, what I learned on my honeymoon, what I have learned in this first year being married. It has changed me. I am, I am holding on for dear life. But there, once you're on the other side of that coin, you are so grateful for certain things. And I love that I'm spending my life with this man, but it is essentially an hour and a half roast of my husband and all of all the things <laughs> that go along with being married. Because, you know, male comedians for the longest time were talking about their wives and their kids and bitching about this and that. And I'm like, well, I'm going to say what's going on in my life. So it is all about, you know, for, uh, for, for anybody who is married or in a relationship or even thinking about getting married or any of that, it will be relatable across the board to everyone, but it is about the, the, the nuts and bolts of my relationship. De okay. Were you, how long were y'all dating before you got married? Um, like 10 years. Okay. And does it really change after you're married? It, well, it changed because we went through a pandemic and we moved in with my mom <laughs> and then like my career took off. So yes, things have changed, but no, being married, it, I, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really change except now you have a legal binding contract with somebody that, you know, if you bury the body, they're going to look to you first. Okay. Yeah. Just remember that. <laughs> Just remember that you are the first person that they're going to question if he goes missing. So I tell him, I'm like, if you have a heart attack on the golf course and they come looking for me, I'm going to be so pissed. This is a real, um, uh, curve ball, but I don't know if somehow you've ever ended up on swinger talk, the swinger side of TikTok. And I laugh. I was laying in bed no, the other night. <laughs> You, Hannah, it is, it is a wild ride. Okay. Just do hashtag swinger talk. And I'm laying in bed the other night and Jeff's like, what are you watching? I'm like, I'm watching swinger talk, Jeff. It's about how all these couples swing together. And we were laughing. I said, here's the thing about women. We sit around when we have girls night, right? We're drinking wine, doing whatever. All we do is bitch about each other's husbands, right? I know when my friend's husband has had diarrhea. I know when my friend's husband <laughs> didn't take out the trash for a week. Da, 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 da. We all sit around and bitch. So I'm like, at no point, no matter how attractive one of my friend's husbands would be, would I be like, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's the one. Like, let's throw some <laughs> no. car keys in a fishbowl tonight and see what happens. I know too much about all of these men. You know what I mean? Uh, it's it's enough. I'm I'm good. Adam's got gotten um picked up or tried to be picked up by swingers multiple times. They never go after me, mm -hmm. but they, they definitely go after him. And it's weird. It's a it's a it was a actually a, a thing in my hometown too, but. I don't know. Yeah. I'm the same way. Like I don't look at any of my friends, husbands and things like, like, I'm like, ew, I know too much about you <laughs> and you get them. I love you, but you also get on my nerves. So I could yeah. never, <laughs> I'm never going there. But I would known about like, you know, Mark's hemorrhoids for the last nine months and I can never look at him <laughs> the same way. <laughs> you know, I'm like, mm, how the hemorrhoids, how they doing, sweetie? You know, <laughs> no too much. Um, what do you plan to do once this tour is over? Like you just said you got back from Italy, but mm -hmm. what's, what's the next thing on the vision board that you are planning to conquer? Cause I feel like you have just like been checking things off left and right. Um, well, I'd love to get this TV show picked up. So again, anybody here who's listening, who knows anybody up at NBC, please tell them to pick up the show. Um, no, I would obviously love to do more acting and television and write mm -hmm. a book. And we're working on that to, um, you know, just tell more stories. I mean, I thought I was going to, I was like, oh, I'm going to take it like a couple months off. But no, you know, the schedule's getting filled. You know, Miss Moneybags over here, I'm going to be shaking my tits <laughs> for cash, doing shows in Cleveland till I'm 80. Even though I can bitch and complain now, I'm like, man, this, like, I'm not going to be home for the next 27 days. I'm going to like, you know, two different, two more countries, 10 cities. Like it's crazy. I'm like, I wouldn't change it for the world. So I don't know, maybe take a nap at some point. I would like a couple of days to take naps, but then I'll be back yeah. on the road. You know yeah. what I mean? Oh, um, you're going to ask if I have plans to have kids. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I always, um, cause I hate that because people ask me that all the time it's, and yeah. it's annoying, but I know that you talk a lot about like 
some of the infertility that you went through and um, where you are with that. And it's like when you're killing it, when you're on the rise or mm-hmm. like it's finally happening, then you also kind of have this pressure of like, okay, if I do want to have a kid, when am I going to do that? How mm-hmm. are you right now in that season? Like, is that still something that you're like, I want it to happen in the future or I'm going to try to do it all, but can you really do it? Where are yeah, you? Yeah. No, listen, this is a great, honest question. Well, in my case, my, my eggs are getting old and dusty and that's not just uh, an age <laughs> thing. Like I, my part of my fertility was that I have like, like no eggs. Right. So I know that I have to go do multiple rounds of IVF again. And that was really, Wait, do you gnarly. have PCOS? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, girl. So, Riddled. so I have all the things too. Mm-hmm. So I, I think also bitch. there's a part of me that's like stressed about it because I've already been like mm-hmm. warned about it all. It's not yeah, even the, I love- the, the not getting pregnant. It's that physically what your body goes through. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, some people freeze their eggs or some people go through IVF and they're successful and it's great. But the problem is it's, I, I don't have the eggs. So to, in yeah. order to put my body through what I need to be put through to get them is just like, it nearly killed me last time I did it. And I'm not even trying mm-hmm. to be dramatic. Like it really did. Um, so yes, no, I mean, in a perfect world, I'd have a baby next year, but I'm like, can I put it in Jeff? Like, do, do I have to have the baby? You know, how are Would we you not- Would you do surrogacy? The, yeah, I mean, it, it it will most likely have to very seriously be an option for us. So um, I am- Honestly, I think it's yeah. great. Oh, yeah. My mom I too had awesome. two horrible pregnancies with my, my myself and my sister. She's like, oh, Heather, outsource it. She's like, you're going to have to anyways because your body's rotten. So go ahead and outsource <laughs> it. And I'm like, honestly, not a bad idea. I think it'd be great because you can talk about it more because I don't think it's – my mom also didn't have like the best time with pregnancy. And she's – you would think a lot of Southern women are like – I know a lot of my friends' mom are like, when are you having babies? Yeah. My mom is not like that at all. Like she wants me to like take the time, mm-hmm. do it when I want to do it, continue to do like my own thing. And if surrogacy was a little, it's just, it's hard for a lot of people to be able to, to do that, have the means to do it. But I think it's wonderful. And then yeah. your body doesn't just get wrecked. I don't want my body to get wrecked. And here's the thing. My doctor's so funny. She's like, Heather, you literally have the body that's built to breed. Like I would be back in the day, I'd be at the Renaissance fair in a village nursing the whole village. Okay. I got big tits, broad shoulders, wide hips. Like I'm ready to go. Okay. I'm built to breed. So then when they went in they're like, Oh, you got like no eggs. I was like, okay, so what's happening here? (laughs) Um, so I had completely since, since a young child, like prepared myself to like carry children. And then when the doctor, when they're like, no, that you might need medical intervention, you're just kind of like, again, God has a funny sense of humor of being like, this may not be your journey, you know? Yeah. But it is something that nobody talks about. I mean, I talk about it with my husband and my best closest friends, but it is, you know, when somebody DMs and they go, a baby would look good on you. And it's always a Southern woman. Honey, when you're going to have that baby, I'm like, you come here and talk to my doctors and come to these IVF appointments with me. Yeah. And then I'll let you know when a baby would look good on me. Because if you don't think <laughs> I'm trying, you're out of your damn mind, Cheryl. Uh, but I think it's cool how you're just like open about it and talk about it. And to make a joke about it, that feels, when you make jokes, that actually make you feel like included in right. the joke of like this freaking sucks. And I just have to laugh to get through. I think that's, that is your superpower of like talking about things that suck and nobody really wants to go through, but making the people who like get it, get it. And I think that's really special and what I enjoy about you and your comedy. And I'm just so excited for people to be more people to be able to experience you with this Netflix special coming out October 17th. Y'all make sure to listen. Go and get your tickets for tour for the last dates. I mean, they're all almost sold out, but you're saying maybe some tour dates will be added? Yeah, I think we're going to add some more dates. We're going international. Yes. So just stay tuned. We get your tickets at heatherontour.com. And Ian, I just want to say you're an absolute joy and a peach, and I want to hug you. And I'm so glad that we were able to connect. This has been I know. a highlight of my day. 